Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the Atlanta Music Project, The College Years, a virtual symposium for high school students thinking about studying music in college. Thank you for joining us. My name is Aisha Moody, and I am the co-founder and chief program officer of the Atlanta Music Project. I'll be your moderator for this panel, which is Audition 101, How to Nail Your Orchestral Audition. Now, for those who are meeting us for the first time, the Atlanta Music Project was founded in 2010 with the mission to empower underserved youth to realize their possibilities through music. We serve 350 students here in Atlanta each year through our various after-school band, orchestra, and choir programs. We also run two youth orchestras, two youth choirs, provide private lessons, and run an annual summer music festival and school called the AMP Summer Series. Now, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, the Atlanta Music Project has produced a lot of online content, including masterclasses, panel discussions, and podcasts. The content is all free and open to the public, and we invite you to access it through our website, atlantamusicproject.org, or through our YouTube channel. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Chestnut Family Foundation for their support of our College Years Virtual Symposium and all of our online content. This event is streamed live on our Atlanta Music Project Facebook page, so please feel free to share the live video on your Facebook timeline. Also, throughout the symposium, we will leave time for questions at the end of each panel, but if you have questions at any time, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A and we'll do our best to address as many as we can. And now, on with the show. Today's session is led by Jonathan Colbert. Born in Atlanta, Jonathan has had a successful international career as a double bass musician in the US and Europe. Jonathan has performed extensively in Europe, Asia, Australia, South America, and the United States. Jonathan is a graduate of the Manhattan School of Music, received a diploma from the Juilliard School, and attended Interlochen Arts uh, Camp as the Emerson Scholar for the state of Georgia. He has performed or held positions with the Atlanta Symphony, uh, Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra, Philadelphia Orchestra, Kansas City Symphony, Hartford Symphony, Malmo Symphony Orchestra, Golden, uh, Gothenburg Symphony, Symphony uh, Chinookay Orchestra, and with the Royal Danish Opera Orchestra. Jonathan has also served as the principal bass of the Sphinx Virtuosi. Jonathan is an award winner in numerous competi competitions, including the International Society of Basses Orchestra Competition and the Bass Europe Orchestral Competition. As a music educator, Jonathan operates a thriving private studio and is the double bass professor at Clark Atlanta University and Morehouse College, and in 2016 was an inaugural coach for the Carnegie Hall's NYO2 Orchestra. Most recently, Jonathan and his wife started a Scandinavian-inspired community space for children and caregivers to come together to create community and find friendships. Jonathan, what is the name of that, of that community space? It's called Haven Huga House. Haven Huga House. Got it. And lastly, Jonathan was a founding teaching artist with the Atlanta Music Project and currently serves on AMP's, fa AMPS faculty as the AMP Academy double bass teaching artist. Jonathan, thank you so much for being with us here today. We're very excited to hear what you have to share. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you so much for having me. No problem. I'm going to let you take it away. We've got your slides up and uh, you do what you do. It's all, the show is yours. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, thank you for the uh, Atlanta Music Project and the Chestnut Family Foundation for having this virtual symposium, the college years. Uh, I wanted to um, obviously talk about how to nail your audition, but I, I basically wanted to do it um, starting from a student or, or if there's a parent or educator who's interested in having students from basically someone who's just starting to take private lessons, who's has shown a, a very keen interest in music and maybe pursuing it as a career. So um, with that being said, yeah, I think that the very first thing that uh, a student should be doing or a teacher who sees a student with promise is making sure that this student has a private instruction. Um, it's so important for you know a student who's doing something new obviously to have guidance and to have guidance from someone who is uh, who has done this for their their own career or knows the path they need to take um, and it's, it's difficult to find that person so I was thinking about ways to do it for me it was my mom obviously was a musician so she needed a bass player and I started that way and she kind of uh, guided me uh, in which direction to take. So that's where I want to start. 
if you have if you're already an orchestra or band or you're a chorus i would start there start with the orchestra band teacher or the core director to find out if they know any teachers uh, ask friends around um, that might be studying privately and if not then i would say find your local arts organization maybe the symphony or local choir ask around it's always important to ask questions uh, as a student as a parent forever you should always be asking questions okay so let's say you find that teacher what are you going to do now to um, make sure that that's the right fit for you because teaching is so individual like even though there's somebody who's the best teacher who has um, students who are doing really well it might not be the best fit for you so you really have to go play for that teacher or sing for that teacher and see if he or she um, is the right fit for you. Um, and how do you do that? How is this teacher, um, number one, do you have a good relationship, a good rapport? Do you feel like you're biting heads a lot? Um, are you, is he or she receptive to the questions that you're asking? Do you feel like they're patient? Are they, um, do they seem committed to you? Because this is a commitment that you're making to them to, to study with them, okay? Um, are they putting you in a position to become a successful musician? And what I mean by that is, um, are you doing things locally? Are you taking auditions for like your all states, your honor bands, honor orchestras, um, summer festivals, summer camps, all of those local things, right? Are you doing those, number one? And number two, how are you doing in those? Uh, things after that it would be okay what about what about nationally are they putting you somewhere to um, um to compete outside of your your city because it's so hard to uh, a lot of times you know if you're in a city and you're like the best player you're going to kind of get a false sense of of where you are where you stand so you really gotta put yourself out there and have the teacher put you in a position so that you know where you stand in the world, really, okay? If you're trying to pursue this as a career, it's very important to do that. Summer festivals, summer camps, and, and to see where you stand. Are they, are they helping you not only do them, but to be competitive in all of those things? Okay, um, that's number one. Number two, this next one would be, there's a bit of a gap between that and not getting ready for the college auditions, but you need to be, you should be focusing on basics. Uh, with your with your teachers, so it's it's hard to kind of. A lot of times, I see students or even professionals. We're constantly getting ready for an audition. You know, when you're a professional, of course, you've you've done all of these things, the basics. You can play pretty much in tune. Hopefully, by this point, sing in tune, uh, have a good sense of rhythm, good musical ideas. So, when you are first studying with a teacher. It is very, 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 very important to no matter how boring it seems to focus on the basic technical aspects of uh, whatever field that you're studying or instrument you're studying. Because if you're just getting ready for auditions and you're basing your, um, you're going to learn your technique through the pieces that you're playing for the audition. Whereas if you focus on the basics, then no matter when the audition comes up, you're going to be ready. You're going to have the technique to be able to just perform. And there's a list. I can play that. Boom, 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 boom. And you just lay it down that way. Okay. So let's jump. Let's jump to uh, getting ready for the college auditions now. Um, number one, I wrote, I think, is know the requirements. Please know the requirements. All schools ask for different things. And it's the last thing you want to do is to go into the audition and not know <laughs> the requirements. So you're playing the wrong things. And that's, that's the first thing. You don't want to go into an audition apologizing. That is not a good look. You're being compared to the people coming in front of you or after you. Or, and your name is, you know, your name is on the line. So these, the music world is very, very small place. And you'll see that. Once you start getting to a certain level, you, you see the same people and they, they know who you are. So know the requirements for each school that you're applying for or whatever you're auditioning for is the number one thing. And double check, triple check um, 
to make sure that you're doing the right thing. Okay, next after that, I would say uh, you find your schools because you've obviously by this point picked your teacher who you want to, who you've been studying with in high school. And they say, okay, I think we should do this school, this school, this school. Um, and you have your list of schools now. Uh, that's another thing. Like, how do you find your list of schools? Like, for each instrument, I would say there's certain schools that are have a reputation of just like you find your teacher. Like, you want to go to a school if you're put, pursuing this as a career, you want to go to a school that you know has a reputation of really teaching your instrument really well, or having a great teacher, or you know, because you want to be around those people. You want to be surrounded by not only the teacher obviously but the students like when, when i was in school it was so important uh, and it was i learned the most i think from uh, my colleagues my the other people that were in school with me we would always practice together play for each other uh and when you're when you hear that you're like oh man she's practicing right now i gotta i gotta step it up you know that kind of thing you know you got to pick the right school in that regard so this next one, I feel like some people are hesitant to do, but it's something that's very common now is reaching out to um, the school or the teacher that you're interested in studying for, for a number of reasons. Um, I think the first one would be so that person, that teacher can meet you so that there's your known entity when you come and take that audition. This is a very, very common thing that a lot of people might not know. It's very normal to go play for a teacher. Uh, I don't know how we're doing it now with all this stuff. You might, it might even be easier. You can just play for somebody over Zoom or something. Um, and a lot of times I think that, at least for me, that audition or that um, lesson or meeting with that teacher is almost sometimes a bigger deal than um, the audition itself because there's going to be some, you know, people are going to understand that when the pressure's on the audition, they're not, People make mistakes, things happen, but for a lesson when everything is kind of laid back, you really have a chance to show you know, who you are and what you can do. Um, that being said, do not go take a lesson or play for somebody if you're not ready. That's wasting everybody's time and that's not gonna make you, that's not gonna help you out at all, especially if that's a school that you really wanna go to. Be ready for that. Be ready for you know, that lesson, be committed for it, okay? Having a plan, and executing it. This is for practicing in general, but also for getting ready for an audition. I, this is something that I didn't learn until late. We always, we always want to play our concertos, all of the things that are fun for us. You know, obviously because practicing is, you know, practicing. We're, it's, it can be a tedious process sometimes. We can, I think we can all agree on that. But when you have a plan, there's something about being organized in your thoughts and going into the practice room knowing I'm going to do this, 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 this. Um, and it's so much more efficient that way. So I think that I'll just give you, and if anybody's interested, I can have a very detailed plan about how I prepare for things. But in general, I think it's important to break uh, the list down and to not just play through the same things every day. So like I said before, there's, if you're auditioning for a lot of schools, which you should be doing, um, just in case, you know, I know it's like, I'm, I'm going to go to that school. And if it doesn't work out, then, you know, you got to have a backup plan. And it, you know, a lot of times that happens. It doesn't mean that you're not a great player, a great uh, person for that school. It's just sometimes, you know, it's a numbers thing. So for the plan, break the list down. Let's say you're going to audition at 10 schools. You know, it seems like a lot. You have to make, you have to find, I would break that, all the different requirements from all the schools, and I'm making one list of all the things that I have to do, okay? And out of that one list, let's say I have, let's say I know where I'm going to audition, you know, hopefully half a year, year in advance. I know which schools I'm going to audition. I look for the requirements. I find them. I make a list. I make that list. After that, I make that list, I'm gonna break that down to maybe five lists, maybe three or somewhere between three and five lists, depending on how many excerpts or solos there is on that list. These different breakdowns don't have to be one piece or like, you know, one section. I break things down so much where it doesn't, 
sound it shouldn't sound like the piece that you're playing like if you walked in the practice room you'd be like what is that I'd be like, oh it's this be like really i only want to practice the things that i need work on really especially that that far in advance there's no reason why you should be playing anything at tempo no matter how much fun you think it is but if you really want to make the steady climb and get there and know that you've done everything that you've done uh every, you've done everything right to get to that point you got to break the list down okay so after you break that list down into however many three to five different lists some of it can be like beginning of mozart violin concert or like just the two measures or you know mozart bassoon concert you know anything just a couple thing a couple things um from any piece it can be one note but it just needs to be broken down because so many of the things that you're going to be practicing and playing are going to relate to each other right so then the closer you get the more you you know condense those lists you know from three to five then it becomes smaller and then it becomes pieces then it becomes and you really break it down so in terms of the practicing to do that i personally and i tell my students this don't i can't focus for more than 45 minutes at a time and that's like focus without the cell phone, computer, TV. That's just me trying to, to get through it. And that's, you know, it's hard. It's really hard to do that. But if you really want to get to that point, I think you really got to try to, to do that. So you break it down, do that, have your plan, execute, execute it. 45 minute session, take a break, maybe another 45 minute session. And then for the last, um, session i would you have to record yourself okay and when i was talking about before like playing with the recording or like just playing things at tempo when you get to a certain point you should be able to have fun now that you've done all that work okay now it's time to i've broken it down i've done a half tempo i've done it with the drone now it's time at the end of a session you say i can play it with a, a recording okay after you've done that you have maybe i don't know two weeks out or no, not more than that. Let's say you have a month out from the audition. I would really start to bump up the, the mock auditions, meaning plan for people. I'm not gonna play for people if I'm not ready. It's the same thing like the teacher. There's no point in me playing for people if I'm not ready. The, the, the comments are not gonna be valid. There's no need for me to do that. I'm not, they're gonna be like, it doesn't sound ready or whatever. So do all those steps, get to the mock audition phase and you'll be ready. You can just focus on performance. The difference between performancing, performance and um, practice is so different. You cannot duplicate that. You can't be in a practice room and then just practice so hard and then maybe some people can do it. But for the most, there's some outliers for sure. But for most people, you kind of have to have um, practice runs, you know, to, to see what it's going to feel like, to get nervous, to play in front of uh, other instrumentalists, play in front of your neighbors, play for people who are going to make you nervous. If you can do that, it's not going away. It is when you get to that audition, you will be nervous. And that's fine. That's just a part of it. Don't try to fight that either. This, you have to learn. We have to learn how to play with it, with the nerves, instead of trying to fight them and push them away. I think nerves are a good thing. A lot of people think they're bad. I'm, I'm so nervous. I think nerves mean that you care. Um, you really care about your performance. You really care about how you're going to present yourself. And it's, it's a good thing. Um, visualize the audition i just want to tell a quick story about someone who um, was taking a lot of auditions and was doing really well she um we used to play for each other a lot in school and she was you know always always doing well and i thought I was like, Man, i'm practicing because we would go practice together and then we would, you know stop practicing go eat or whatever and she was always i'm like i'm practicing the same amount that she is and there's, there's not that consistency like, like she's doing, you know, like she's having. What is it? So I asked her, you know, like I said before, ask questions, ask your peers, especially when you're in school or even in high school, what are they doing? What, what are they doing to be successful? Or, cause you can learn from everyone. Um, so she was, I said, what is, what is she doing? Um, so I asked her and she said, well, she had this, she pulled out this binder. And then that binder uh, was the audition that she was currently preparing for. Can't remember what orchestra it was. Let's say it was the San Francisco Symphony. So it said San Francisco and Symphony on the front. It was organized, just like the practicing. Already I was like, wow, this is, 
she's taking this seriously. San Francisco Symphony, and then opened it up, opened the notebook up, and there was a picture of the hall in there, like the hall in San Francisco where she was going to be auditioning. And I said, wow, that's cool, what's that? That's just a picture of the hall. And she was like, no, every time I open this, I wanna feel like I'm there. I want to visualize myself playing on that stage. You know, Cause right now we have the technology to do that where you can look and see what it's gonna look like. What does this school look like? What, you know? And I thought that that was amazing. That was the first thing. And then the second thing, she turned the page and there was like people's pictures. And she had, you know, gone onto the website. What, I mean, might be a little creepy, but I, I think it was, I thought it was cool. She went onto the website and took picture, like the bios from all the people in the orchestra, took their pictures and said, okay, these are the people that I'm gonna be listening to potentially. So not only did she put herself on the stage in the hall, but she also had, because these are blind auditions, college is not, they're gonna see you, but just giving an example of the preparation. She put faces to the name, to who she would be playing for behind the screen. And I thought that was amazing. And to this day, I think about that when I'm taking an audition to really try to visualize, put yourself there. When you're starting to play for people and take mock auditions, it's, um, it's crucial to already put yourself there. So the day of the audition is not the day of the audition. You've done it already so many times. There's nothing new about that day. And we'll talk about that later. The last one is recording yourself. Um, mock auditions, practicing, anything and record yourself early in the process. Confidence needs to be at a sky high when you walk into any audition. And if you wait too long, just like this, in a, just like this master class, recording yourself is hard, right? Just like listening to yourself talk. Like if I were to go back and listen to this master class, I would be like, man, what are you, what are you talking about? But it's the same thing for listening to yourself play an instrument. It's hard to do. You, you hear things that you don't think you're doing when you record yourself. So if you do that early in the process, you can kind of grow as the recordings and you can grow with the recordings and know how you sound so that instead of like a week before, you're like, oh man, I didn't record myself. Let me record myself before my audition next week. And you listen to it and you're like, oh, this is not where I thought I was. Well, I mean, for me at least, that's hard for my confidence and I don't want my confidence anywhere except going up when I walk into the audition. Um, okay, what is the next thing here talking about? Oh, all right, big day. Just like we were talking about, uh, I just talked about before, the big day should not be the big day. Uh, the big day is just another day because you've been doing all the mental preparation, all the work that you need to get there. All you got to do on that day is do everything that you're doing, that you've been doing, right? You're just, you visualized it, you know the room, and hopefully you've played for the teacher maybe, and you know what they want, and you don't, you can take all that, all that things that you think about in your head out, you know, don't think about, oh, what do they want? Like, you play for them, you have an, some kind of an idea of what they're looking for, and you know what you want to do, you have a plan, you're going to execute your plan, and you're going to play your best. Okay. Presenting yourself, this is, this is you. This is your moment. This is your audition. As soon as you walk on stage, in the room, wherever it is, it's an audition. This, that's a committee. You're being judged by these people. Um, that, now, these people want you to do well, but that's just the, you know, the bottom line. So if not only are you being judged, but you're being compared to people on either side of you that have taken the audition also. So if such and such comes in and they're, you know, dressed really nicely from that moment. That's their, it's hard, basically it's hard to recover more. It's hard to recover if you came in and your first impression is not that, you know, you, you can do whatever you want to do, but if you came in not looking your best, I think it does a lot of things. It's hard for them to um, listen different. They're going to listen in a different way. Um, and it might sound weird, but it's just the truth. They're going to listen in a different way. If somebody else came in, they look nice. They're just going to think that person cares more, is more dedicated. Um, and then for me, I like when I dress nice, I feel good. When I feel good, I feel like I play better. Um, and I, I don't have to worry about, do I have the right thing on? Or do, you know, you just be comfortable, but also this is you, you know, 
your name was on the line here. Really, really put it out there, okay? Be respectful and smile. What do I mean by that? I don't mean that you have, this is not so much in the audition. This is just around um, the audition. When you get to the uh, school or wherever, like probably people who have done Allstate know this or professional auditions, you're gonna see other people that play your instrument that are also have the same dreams that you have, right? Be nice, be humble, um, and respect your colleagues. Uh, like I said earlier in this um, presentation, the music world is small, and you don't realize at that moment the relationships that you're making with even people that you meet in an audition, how that one day could affect you in a negative way negative way you know it could affect you getting a job it could affect a lot of things you know your reputation is out there is that as well and it just it's just good energy to have i always felt you know you don't have to not you don't have to a lot of people want to be focused and that's fine but don't be be respectful and be humble and be nice to people and when you get into the audition smile the other they, you know they want to see that you're relaxed and um, you can be serious, but you know, if you can smile, a little smile, don't just be yourself. Don't, I'm not asking for a fake smile. Just want you to be yourself and stick to what uh, you're doing. Um, yeah, this day is no different than any other day. You've done all the stuff, you're ready. And the committee, usually these are musicians who have done the same thing. This process of taking an audition is unique to obviously artists, but they've done the same thing. They've been on the other side. They've taken an audition to get something at some point and they know what it's like. So don't just know that they are on your side. When listening to people take auditions, I feel like I'm much more audition, much more nervous than I am than when I audition for something myself. I'm pulling for them, especially somebody who's doing really well and just like, don't, you know, just, you can do it. Um, take your time in the audition. I tell my students that a lot, especially after each piece, they're not looking for somebody who's, perfect you're looking for somebody you know you don't want to make mistakes but somebody who is a thoughtful artist thoughtful musician who is mature who has thought about all of these things so a little thing like taking time after one piece or the end of a piece instead of taking time and then just turning the pages and and do that and it's, it's very off-putting and it's a tiny tiny thing but it's i kind of relate it to like uh the olympics like the 100 meter dash or whatever it's, it's milliseconds between winners first and second place. And it's just a matter of all these tiny things that we can take and put together. Like what I'm saying, taking time at the end of each piece. Okay, letting the air clear. They're gonna see that, you know, sometimes we listen with our eyes, okay? Um, have your music in order, please. Or if you're gonna do it from memory, don't just do it on that day. I see a lot of people who, they change it up on the audition day for some reason for the whole process of practicing, they've been playing with music, and for some reason, they're like, okay, I'm gonna do it from memory today. No, do everything that you've been doing that day, or previous to that on that same day. If you've been practicing and performing, doing mock auditions from memory, great. Do the audition from memory. If not, please have your music there, have it in order before you go in the room, so you're not just flipping through pages. My teacher used to say, no funny stuff. Just go into your audition and play. They just wanna hear the music, and they wanna, um, see somebody who's presentable. Okay, let's go on to the what they're looking for here. All those things that we talked about at the beginning of this slide, um, the basics, right? They want to hear somebody with uh, good intonation, uh, a nice sound, somebody who's really, you know, a nice, beautiful sound can a lot of times override like these small mistakes. Okay, you need to be really focused on making a good sound on your instrument with your voice um, all the time on every single note that you can. Don't, the things that I've noticed is a lot of times people, they'll have like a couple notes that they really love that sound really great. And then like other notes that are not too comfortable with. And we said at the beginning, you have to, that's what you have to practice. You, you don't need to be practicing the ones that sound great and that you're really comfortable with. The other things are not going away. They're not, it's not just gonna magically go away. They're looking for um, potential. This is somebody who their job will be to teach you in the way that they know how to teach and the way that they believe in. So a lot of times people ask, 
what happens if I mess up in the audition? And it depends. It depends on how everything else is going. Obviously, you don't want to have a lot of mistakes, but, you know, mistakes happen, especially in an audition. You know, there's stories of people dropping bows and still winning, you know, professional jobs. Um, so be musical. Uh, do everything that you've done the days previous or the months previous to that. I've also been told, and I like this one too, that you need to practice like it means the world to you and you need to perform like it doesn't, like this, you're just carefree, you just let it all go and trust everything. They're looking for someone who understands the pieces that they're performing. So just because um, you're playing these pieces, these are people who know these pieces. They're, perform they're performers or they're teachers. They know this. They listen to these auditions every year. There's a certain way that these pieces should go. We talked about playing with the recordings. This is why. So that when you go in, it's not just notes on a page that you're playing. You're really, you know the piece. They can almost sing along the other parts uh, with you. Okay. Um, what's the next here? Yeah. Big, big one, mental, mental game of music, uh, of taking an audition, of everything. I think it's, I almost feel like it, it definitely is for me more of a mental thing than a performance thing. And I should have written more about, but I can talk about this forever. Um, when preparing for an audition, or if, let's say you're in high school, right? And you're getting ready and you're in like a youth orchestra and all of your other youth orchestra friends are getting ready for an audition and you're constantly just like listening to them and you're going to hear them regardless. You're worried about what they're doing. They got into this. I didn't get into this. You know, this game that we play is very, very normal game and it's very easy to do. Try not to do it if you can. Be supportive of people and do the work that you have to do because it doesn't matter. It does not matter what anybody else is doing. When you're in that audition, it's nobody else in there. It's just you. It's nobody. It's just you. The next one uh, is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I mean, I have taken a lot of auditions. I've done a lot of competitions. I've done a lot of things. I've auditioned for a lot of schools. Didn't get into a lot of things. I've only gotten a couple things compared to the amount of times that I haven't gotten anything. Um, and it's taken me a long time to realize that number one doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. At the moment, it's everything. It means the world to you. It's like, I have to, I had to get into this school. I had to get this job. I had to go to this summer festival. I had to do all, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because you're still growing as a musician, even though you didn't get in, that doesn't mean you didn't work hard. It doesn't mean that you're still not great. It just means that you didn't get into that one thing or you didn't get that one job. You know, there can only be one person who can do it. It's like, again, I'll go back to Olympics. I think we're similar to athletes. When people are at the Olympics, so there can only be one winner in a race. That does, that does not mean that everybody else is not an Olympic caliber uh, athlete. They are. And you should treat yourself the same way. Um, and you've done the work. You've done everything. If you've taken all of these steps that I've been talking about, I think that it, it will really help your nerves and your feeling of, for me at least, I get, I've gotten the most nervous when I wasn't prepared the way uh, that I should have been. So when you are organizing your thoughts and you're prepared and you get to that moment, I really feel like it helps everything. It really propels everything to another level. Yeah, so mental game is a big one. Take care of yourself. This is not only for auditions, this is all the time. Um, you're, you're a musician, you are an athlete, you are doing something that's physical, whether it be using your voice, using, you know, trumpet player, every, we're all doing something that is physical. Okay, that's number one. Number two is I think physical activity in general is something that you know helps get you out of all of these thoughts also builds confidence uh, obviously healthy to, to move around and then um to sleep all the things that you know you should be doing you should really excuse me you should really do them when you're getting ready for something 
um, especially like uh, an, an audition where your body is under so much stress. Uh, I've had um, times where I was getting ready for an audition and I've just been focusing on one thing. I'm like, I've got to practice, I've got to do all stuff. And I was like, wait, I'm not, I'm not really treating myself really well. My body at some point is going to break down. Um, and it probably will. I mean, maybe not when you're really young, but the older you get, this is for the older people, I'm just joking. You need to be, you know, you need to create these habits that are, are long lasting. And one more thing before we move on is my teacher used to say there's only one position and that's balance, right? Everything needs to be balanced, whether it be how you practice, how you perform, how you sleep, how you eat. What you do outside of music is also important. You need to have the outlet that you go to so that you're done practicing. If you're practicing within those 45 minute blocks with like a drone and a metronome, by the time that 45 minutes is over, you're going to, your head is going to like be ringing. You know, it should be. Then you, you need that break. That's what for me the break is for. Is like I have to get out of the room. It's like that drone is going to make me go crazy. So balance, balance and everything so that um, you're basically unstoppable. The last one, the last thing I think, I don't know how we on time, but I think it's getting close, are some books and people who I want to talk about um, to help with um, the mental game and just the overall balance and people who have helped me out a lot. Don Green um, wrote a book called Audition Success. Obviously, we're talking about auditions. This is something, uh, you can get these on Amazon. Um, it's a great book. I think he even has an audio version uh, of that book. And then uh, Noah Kagayama is a performance psychologist who I've worked with a couple times myself who uh, created uh, something called the Bulletproof Musician, which is like a an approach that he's done. He's a musician, but then he stopped and started just focusing and guiding and helping people on the mental aspect of it. And he, he was a life changer for me, uh, working with him was great. So I would check his website out. Uh, I think he has some books too. He's a very um, important person in the music world right now. Uh, Rob Knopper, um, percussionist in the Metropolitan Opera. Uh, Noah and Rob work together sometimes. And there, there we go. Um, Rob Knopper, is, he met, made something called um, Audition Hacker, I believe. Uh, he's also someone who's incredible, right? He's failed many, many more times than he succeeded. And I think he talks about it a lot in his book and uh, on the Audition Hacker. But so he's learned from failing pretty much. And I think that that's something that we all need to do is to appreciate the losses, learn from them. I take every time that I don't, um, any time or I don't do well in audition, I give myself 48 hours to really like process it. After that, it's time to, it's time to get back on the horse, so to speak, because you grew, you know, it, it's, it's just how it is. You do your best and um, yeah, that's, that's it I think for, for what I had to say, I felt like I was talking a lot, maybe. You know. Hey, Jonathan, it's Aisha coming back on here. Hi, Aisha. That was fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing um, all of that knowledge with us. We, uh, we learned a lot, gave us a lot to work with. I have, uh, we're gonna take some questions um, from the audience. If there are any questions, you can certainly drop them in the chat. And uh, we'll, we'll get to it. I have one uh, so far, and it's about um, the process after the audition. And I know this is for a, a college audition, but uh, the idea is if you are watching, you're probably going to go on some auditions before you get to your college auditions. And so those auditions are, I guess, practice, you know, for the college audition. When you go on the audition and you, and you do not have an audition that you're very proud of, what is your process afterwards? And I know people say, you know, you get up and, and dust yourself off and just go back for the next one. But of course, that's easier said than done. And I love the Olympics analogy that you gave. Could you just yep. talk a little bit about your process on um, 
really the the reality of after a post audition process. Sure. Yeah, it's it's difficult. It's really really hard. I'll say that first. Uh, you put so much into it. You're very dedicated to it. It's everything, you know. And the letdown after is very very difficult. So acknowledging that is number one. Realizing that, you know, letting yourself be upset about it. You know, you're like this is and not trying to you know do that thing like you just say like okay I'm good dust yourself off because no be in it live in it you know let that fuel you so for me when I um, it's changed over time obviously but earlier you know I was I was really upset about it I would you know get upset and be like oh this, they they did they don't like me they don't like it's like it's not what it is I think usually definitely now what I do is I take there's something that I didn't do. I need to process, even if that's not the truth, even if like, let's say I played great and I just didn't get through. The healthy thing for me to think about is that, okay, I need to just keep going. I need to keep getting better. I need to improve this, this, and this. Really try to, in that moment of the audition, a lot of times I think we've all had this experience where we get to the audition and we get there and it's a blur. When we come out, we're like, oh man, I don't, I wasn't really there. I don't really know what happened. I think it was good, but I'm not sure. So really being in that moment and processing. So no, no matter what, when it happens, you can go on the other side and say, okay, I, this was good. This was okay. What happened there? This is what I can improve upon. Um, and yeah, and just realizing that it's so abstract, the audition process, because I think about this a lot that let's say that there's, there's a blind audition with, um, nine panelists right and you don't you take the audition and you do not get through mm. if there was nine different people there you maybe could have gotten through because music is so subjective people have different ideas right so it's kind of it's so random in a way you can only do what you can do you can only go and perform and do your best and everything outside of that is out of your control you don't you know don't don't spend your time saying i have to get this this is it this is the one this is for me otherwise i can't do it no it's, it happens but again it's hard to not think like that that's natural that's normal accept that but um do the best you can yeah we have one more question uh from from the audience and it's about uh when you're going to find the teacher or you go to meet the teacher beforehand and maybe do a, a demo lesson uh if you if you're a young student and you've been working with most likely one teacher or one or two teachers for the majority of your life how do you even know what to look for um in that new teacher because you're going to a new level it's something different um is it someone whose personality you like i mean that's a part of it but what all goes into saying okay because a lot of people as we said earlier today and i think you mentioned as well they end up choosing their school based on that lesson with the teacher they're choosing a teacher and not choosing a school which happens all the time yeah, sure. Yeah, I think <laughs> if you're if you're at the point where this I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about going from high school to college, right? You're talking about that teacher. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. So if you're at that point, then you know, you know, you're you're ready for school. So you're at a high enough level where you can kind of make decisions on your own and say, okay, this teacher, I really feel like I'm making a big jump, and it makes sense to me. It clicks. Like that kind of stuff works. Like. I mentioned it before, even though it's the best teacher, it doesn't mean that it's the right fit for you. Now, to say that, you have to be open. You have to be open-minded enough to say, I don't agree with this, but it might, it might work. Or make, him, make them your own ideas. Because it's also something I think about a lot too. Any teacher that you're gonna be studying with or any preferred person you play for, the things that they're teaching you are things that they've thought of or things that other teachers, their teachers have taught them or just things that, they, things that they've learned over time. So mm -hmm. what I would recommend was be a sponge all the time, whether it's with your peers or with other teachers. You got to take something from everybody. You got to take it from everywhere and create your own ideas. Uh, listen to your teacher, of course, but also I, I would never recommend being like, oh, I'm not going to do that. Try it try it, you know, and see, it might work for you. You never know. And if something, my teacher also told me this, if you're doing something that feels comfortable, usually there's no change 
that's going to happen, right? It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to, you can't, you don't, you don't want a teacher who is just doing all the things that you've been doing in a way. That means that you're not really going to grow, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You want to really make a change. So it's going to be, you know, without, you know, discomfort, change is not really happening sometimes. Not all the time, of course, it should, it should feel good too, yeah. but. It's good for you to acknowledge that discomfort because when we are encountered with it, sometimes people say, oh, well, I'm not used to that. And that translates sometimes as that's not good for me, but that's not right. for me. But that discomfort um, is a good thing. Sometimes you need to go in that direction. So thank you for that answer. Uh, right. We have one from Ms. Paris. And right. her question is, how should I start looking for schools that fit me best for my instrument? Okay. Well, your teacher obviously should be helping you with these things. Um, no, I think that for your instrument, it depends like you have to be look you have to at the beginning of this i was i was mentioning local how are you doing with local things how are you doing with national things are you getting in in these things so you have to kind of base at some point you're going to have to really be honest with yourself and say okay what kind of school am i going to go to what do i want to do do i want to do this as a career how will i what chances do i have um, making it a career and then you can kind of base your schools off of that. You know, it's, I think I talked about this, but the number one thing is obviously you got to practice, right? You can't, you ain't getting into no schools if you ain't putting the work in, right? So if you're serious about it, you know, and you really want to, you know, pursue this as a career, um, I think usually I try to tell people like soft, after their sophomore year, going into their junior year, they want to do it, they really got to start thinking about contacting these schools. I would say just junior year is when I would start playing for teachers in schools, reaching out to them, getting my name out there, letting them know who I am so that I talked about you're a known entity when you walk into that audition room, if you audition out of school, but also for you, you're, gonna, you're not going to be nearly as nervous if you've met that teacher, you've had a good lesson with them, they know you, you know, it's, it's a lot easier that way. And that's a thing, you know, that's a lot of people don't take advantage of, but it's pretty, it's very, very common now. Yeah, I don't know if that answered your question, but. Yeah, no, that answered the question, definitely. Uh, one from our good friend Dante here. Uh, as a student, should I be pursuing solo opportunities like competitions and concerto uh, auditions, or should I just focus on auditions for youth orchestras in college? Yeah, good question, Dante. Uh, I think it's difficult. And, like I ended with this, there needs to be a balance, right? There has to be, you should be, you know, performing and audition for th auditioning for things, but depending on where you are in your, your playing or in your career, I, I have students sometimes who they're just, they want, they're like taking every audition, every competition, and it's hard, they're not getting any, but they're like, I'm taking them, I'm doing all this. Like, well, you're not getting them because you're not ready. So there's, like I said, there's a balance. If you're doing well in them, um, then, you know, you can take them, you know, but if you're not, then you need to not take as many, focus on some technique things, some fundamentals so that when they come up, you can do them. But I would never put myself out there if I'm not ready. And that's for a student too. There, a lot of people, you know, want to have their students do the, If they're not ready, that's not going to be a helpful experience for them. They're not going to, they're not going to enjoy it. They're like, it's not going to be fun. I want it to be fun for them because fun equals, you know, practicing equals motivation equals, you know, all of these things. If it's, but if it's a bad experience, they're, they're not going to want to do that again. So quite the valuable point for any music educators that <laughs> tune in. Uh, thank you for that. I have one last question. Okay. Uh, it's from uh, Jonathan. And the question is, a, a different Jonathan, of course. What should I focus on when preparing for demo lessons? Anything in particular? Yeah, that's that's another good question. Demo, you wanted to. I would not, depending on your instrument or in mm -hmm. this teacher you study with. You want to sound good. You want to play something that sounds good. I promise you, if a student came to me and played the most beautiful scale in in a demo lesson, I would say, "Wow, okay." Number one, this person has thought about is, is you know conscious enough to be like, I just want to play something that sounds beautiful, that sounds good, and then the teacher can work with you that way. Whereas if somebody comes in and they're just finding all, you're not going to fool me by or a teacher by picking the hardest piece 
like teachers have ears <laughs> they're not gonna they don't care what the piece is as long as it sounds good and they can see some potential to work with you so even if i'm at the same audition for juilliard and they have the whatever your instrument is um the repertoire for the demo lesson don't you don't have to do that i would do something that you feel comfortable with something that you've been working on your, with your teacher um if you're going to go into performance i would do you know a concerto or some orchestral excerpts for them something that gives them an overall idea of your playing seeing how flexible you are um show a wide a wide range of uh performing and different variations i think would be the best thing for you yeah. to do mm. sometimes less is more that's right, right. Uh, I think those are all of our questions. This was a fantastic session, Jonathan, a wealth of information. All right. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for everything. And for everyone uh, tuning in, we will be making the slides available to um, everyone on, on the Zoom feed. So you will get a copy of that. And uh, Jonathan, I'd just like to thank you again for the information and for sharing your expertise with us on this afternoon. And uh, for everyone watching, I have a couple of announcements for you. Tomorrow, we are going to have day two of our college uh, symposium, uh, and it's going to be fantabulous. We have at 12 p.m. a senior send off. We have eight graduating seniors here at AMP. One of them is one of Mr. Jonathan's students. And uh, even though things are a little bit crazy right now in the world, we're still going to honor our seniors. So join us on Zoom at 12 p.m. for our senior send off. Then at 3 p.m., we talked about auditions today, how to nail the audition. The interview is also a very important part of the college admissions process. Don't just be a good player, but not know how to talk to people. That won't work so well for you. So tomorrow at 3 p.m., we're going to do a session on how to nail your college interview. You don't want to miss that. That is going to be um, run by the Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Costco Wholesale. So I'm sure he knows something about interview skills, um, as well as music attorney Alandis Brandis. Now, that's 3 p.m. At 4 p.m. and 5 p.m. tomorrow, we have what was, is like the part two of our set today's sessions. Now, today we taught you what to do in an audition. Tomorrow, we're going to show you. Tomorrow, we have mock auditions. At 4 p.m., we have um, audition, a voice master class for, um, at 4 p.m., voice master class, and at 5 p.m., um, or violin master class. So, um, based on, you know, what your instrument is, if you're a uh, voice or orchestra, you want to tune into one of those and get some tips on everything that we talked about today, what that really looks like in practice. Okay. And that's what we're going to go over tomorrow. Um, 4 p.m. session will be um, hosted by Damian Sneed of the Manhattan School of Music. And the 5 p.m. session is with Helen Kim, of Ken uh, professor of violin at Kennesaw State. It's going to be fantastic. I thank you all so much for joining us. I hope you learned a lot. And uh, again, if you have um, any questions, you can reach us at info at atlantamusicproject.org and you will get the slides uh, shortly for, for tuning in. Thank you, Mr. Jonathan. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Hope you all have a great evening. Thank you.